Tonight's event will be a moderated discussion of Ambassador Haley's new book, With All Due Respect, Defending America with Grit and Grace. I'd like to begin the program by introducing um, Mary Beth Buchanan, who will be guiding the conversation, and then I will also be introducing the author herself, Ambassador Haley. Mary Beth Buchanan serves as president of the New York City Lawyers Chapter. She is general counsel to Kraken, the world's, one of the world's leading global digital asset exchanges. Before entering the private sector, Mary Beth had an impressive career in public service which included serving as ethics and reputational risk officer at the United Nations. In that capacity, she conducted the first global ethics and reputational risk assessment for the UN Peacing and Special Political Operations. This required her to visit countries like Kenya, Rwanda, Lebanon, and Israel to interview UN peacekeepers and determine areas most at risk to misconduct which would uh, compromise UN peacekeeping abroad. In addition to her work at the UN, Mary Beth spent 17 years in the US Attorney's Office where she was appointed US Attorney for the Western District of Pennsylvania. I had the privilege of working with Mary Beth when she was a partner at Brian Cave Leighton Paisner, and I'm fortunate to call her a mentor. So sorry, I don't have a podium. So it's a little awkward. Next, I'd like to introduce Ambassador Nikki Haley. Born in South Carolina to American or Indian American immigrants, Ambassador Haley describes her family's story as leaving behind a political caste system in India to come to America and stand before the law and before government as individuals, not as members of a group. In that spirit, Ambassador Haley began a career in state politics and eventually began, became the first woman governor of South Carolina. During her time as governor, she drew the nation's attention as she led the state through a tragedy of a white supremacist opening fire on a Bible study class in Charleston. In response, she brokered a peaceful removal of the Confederate flag from the state house grounds. At the end of her second term for governor, she was appointed to lead the nation as ambassador to the United Nations under President Trump. She represented the United States in the world's most challenging situations, including threats from Russia, North Korea, and Iran. Particularly relevant to recent events, in 2018, during her tenure as ambassador, she advised President Trump on withdrawing from the Iran nuclear deal in light of information that Iran had not disclosed a past covert nuclear weapons program. Apart from, <laughs> Apart from her public service, Ambassador Haley is married to, Mick to Michael Haley, has two children, and an adorable labradoodle named Bentley that actually has his own Instagram account. <laughs> I know we are all looking forward to hearing her speak about her second book, With All Due Respect, Defending America with Grit and Grace. Please welcome Mary Beth Buchanan and Ambassador Nikki Haley. Ambassador Haley, thank you again so much for being here with us. Um, with your, your poise, your confidence, 
your decisiveness and your integrity. You are an inspiration, not just to all of us here this evening, but to many around the world. Well, thank you so much. And I have to say, it's a real thrill to be here at the Federalist Society in New York. I didn't know you guys had a chapter here. I will tell you that uh, <laughs> I was have been a longtime fan of the Federalist Society. Um, as governor, when I first became ambassador, have spoken in DC, but I can tell you, you probably feel like I do, that I said that the United Nations was a good stepping stone for me because it prepared me to be a Republican in New York. So it's a... Uh... <laughs> well, we, we would have been very happy to have had you join us during your time at the UN, but after reading your book, I can see that, we can all see that you were very, very busy. Yes. Well, for those of you um, who have read the book or you haven't read the book, uh, you're all in for a treat um, because this book is so rich with uh, details about the ambassador's life from the time her parents came to the U.S. until the time that she left her position as the uh, U.S. ambassador to the U.N. The, um, the book includes so much material, and it's hard to imagine that most of it really is about a 14-year period. I mean, there's a little bit in, in, in the early days, but most of it really is condensed um, in the time that you were in public office. You know, I wrote a book, <clears throat> a book prior to this, and it was called Can't Is Not an Option. And I wrote that right after I was elected governor because it was such a brutal race. You know, South Carolina, to win in South Carolina, it's a blood sport. And it was such a brutal race. And I had so many people come up to me and say, after seeing what you went through, I would never run for office. And I was devastated because we need real, normal people to run for office. <laughs> I have run for office, and I can attest how brutal it is. <laughs> so I, I wrote that one then, and then after leaving the United Nations, the reason I decided to write this book um, when I did was I knew that, you know, history is what it is and the facts would be there, but I wanted the emotion to be with it. I wanted you to know what it was like to be in that back room when we were negotiating something. I wanted you to know what it was like when we did bring down the Confederate flag in South Carolina. I wanted you to know what all of those emotions were along with it. So I've often said everyone should write, um, whether it's a book or whether it's a journal, and I have never been good at writing a journal, but I continue to write books. It allows you to come to terms with your life. It allows you to come to terms with decisions you've made, with mistakes you've made, with lessons that you've learned in a way that gives you real peace and healing. And so I would advise anybody to just write a journal because there's a lot that happens in your life and a lot of challenges that you go through your life in your life. And when you put it on paper, you suddenly forgive yourself or pat yourself on the back in ways that you normally would not. Yeah, I'd like to take you back all the way to, to the beginning when your parents came to the United States. I mean, they were very successful in India. And can you tell us why they thought that um, their children could not achieve that same success and why they wanted to come here? They were both from very wealthy families in India. <clears throat> My mom was a lawyer. She was actually one of the first female members to be named to the bench. But because of the times and how difficult it was, she was never able to actually sit on the bench. So for her to see me become governor was a huge thing for her because we, I was able to do what she was not able to do. And so both of them grew up in wealthy families. Money was not the issue. But what you find out in other countries is you can have all the money in the world, but that doesn't mean you have opportunity. And it doesn't mean you have the ability to work as hard as you can and be as successful as you want. And they wanted that for their family. I was born in South Carolina. I'm the third of four kids. But even back then, they knew that if they had a family, they wanted their family to have more than they had. And I think that's the story you hear of so many immigrants across our country is they bring their families here for a better life. And a better life doesn't mean money. A better life means opportunity. A better life means education. A better life means the idea that you can have a good quality of life. And I think that's so important. Although you had um, some challenges growing up in, in Bamberg, and in part because of the skin tone or maybe cultural or religious, but I'm sure you had a lot of fond memories there too. Um, are, are there some that you could share with us tonight? 
Well, I always tell people we were the only Indian family in a small southern town. Um, my father wore a turban. He still does to this day. My mother wore a sari. And they truly didn't know who we were, what we were, or why we were there. You know, but I remember when I would come home from being teased, my mom would always say, your job is not to show them how you're different. Your job is to show them how you're similar. And it was over that time that I and my brothers and my sister, we did that. But my parents also did that. It was not easy in the beginning. But that community came to accept us. And, you know, it allowed my father to teach at a university. It allowed my mother to start a business. And it allowed me to run for governor. And so you look back at that, and I look at growing up in that small town, everyone just took care of each other. It was 2,500 people, one stoplight. We thought the world had just gotten as good as it could get when we got a Hardee's. You know, it was just one of those towns. You couldn't think about doing something wrong without somebody telling your mom. But what was so important was, whether it was me going to Girl Scouts at the local church, or whether I was a tennis player, playing tennis you know, all hours of the day at the tennis courts, it was a safe place. It was a place where neighbors took care of neighbors. And you really did, um, it was, a, it was a poor rural area. So we didn't know what we didn't have, but we all knew to respect and take care of each other. Is there any advice that you would give uh, to children of parents who, who recently immigrated to the United States based upon your experiences? You know, I think it's important for immigrants to remember where they come from. I mean, that defines you. That is a rich cultural heritage that you want to have. But I also think that when you do come to the United States, there is lots of opportunity. But it, again, is you're in a country where you have to have your own respons individual responsibility. You have to know how to not only do for yourself, but do for your community. And it's like our parents always taught us. They said the best way to appreciate your blessings is to give back. And I think that any immigrant that comes here, you're getting a host of opportunities and gifts. But you have to give that back. You have to give it back to your community. You have to give it back to your neighbors. You have to give it back to anyone else that follows you. And remember, you know, it's the one thing that, you know, we've always said is don't just do for yourself, but do for everybody around you. Now, Clemson has definitely been in the news recently. Uh, my heart is still broken. <laughs> we were there. We were there. And we... I don't know what happened. I just don't, but I can tell you that next year we will be back. We will be back. Well, tell, tell us how you chose Clemson for your undergraduate degree. So interestingly enough, when I was growing up, my parents wanted to keep their kids close. They never wanted us to be out playing around. And so my sister, um, my mom started a um, clothing and gift store. So my sister would always work in the business, and I wasn't interested in that. And we had a bookkeeper that was leaving, and she needed to train someone. And my mom had not found someone, and she said, you know, I'm getting concerned. We need to get someone who can do the job. Job, and I happened to be walking by and my mom grabbed my arm and she said train her she will do it and she said but she's 13 <laughs> and she said if you train her she will do it and so at 13 I was literally making the deposits I was doing payroll I was balancing our ledger I had my first audit when I was 16 <laughs> It wasn't until I got to college that I realized that wasn't normal. And now I know it was completely child labor. I mean, completely child. Tell me. But, you know, I developed a love of numbers because in that process of doing the accounting, you learn to stretch a dollar. And when times are tough, you hunker down, you get creative, and you set priorities. And when times are good, you don't celebrate because you know the bad times are going to happen again. And so I developed just that love of numbers and that love of you know, figuring out how to get from point A to point B and how to plan. And so it was with that that I just decided to go to Clemson. It was the only school I applied at. And, um, and the rest is history. Graduated in accounting. 
was going to say this will be a safe guess. This is why you majored in accounting. Yes, yes. And what was your first job after college? I was accounting supervisor for a corporation in Charlotte and six of its subsidiaries. And it was a recycling corporation, and it was um, all men. And I was the only executive on the team. And I was green and excited and um, anxious to do my job. And I remember that we had one of our first executive meetings, and the CEO was running late. And we were all sitting there waiting on him, and he came running in, very apologetic, and said, I'm so sorry, I'm late. And the CFO looked over at me and said, Nikki, will you get Paul a cup of coffee? And I remember not knowing what I was gonna do, but knowing that how I handled that situation would change how they treated me forever. And I said, Absolutely, I am happy to. And I leaned over to the phone on the table and called my assistant, and I said, Pam, would you please get Paul a cup of coffee? <laughs> they never asked me to do that again. It's important to teach. So going from accounting to running for the state legislature is a big leap. Can you tell us what motivated you to do that? So after working um, for the guys down the hall in the corporation, I went back to the family business, and um, it had grown tremendously at that point, and I, so I was doing all of the um, accounting work for the business, and I happened to be complaining one day in my office to my mom, saying how hard it was to make a dollar and how easy it was for government to take it. And my mom said, don't complain about it, do something about it. I truly did not know you weren't supposed to run against a 30-year incumbent in a primary. I did not know that. It was ignorance is bliss. I just thought there were way too many lawyers at the State House, no offense, and they needed one really good accountant. So, um, so once we, um, once I signed up for it and realized that the incumbent was related to half the district. Um, the only option was to win. So my husband got in the driver's seat, I got in the passenger seat, we put our two little ones in the back seat watching TV, and I started knocking on doors. And as I knocked on doors, I would never say anything negative about the incumbent. I would always say we respect him and we respect his time and service, but it's time for something different. And um, a hard fought race, but um, was fortunate enough that they gave me a chance to go to the State House. There's a, there's a really cute anecdote in the book about a Chinese dinner that you and your husband, Michael, had. And so let me set that up, because <laughs> this race was brutal. It was in South Carolina. It was, um, they had had the same incumbent for 30 years. Um, it was an agricultural community. And so here was this you know, brown girl who was running for office in a district and she's not from here. It was one of those um, situations. And so I had to do a lot. I had to go to places um, and, you know, really introduce myself and, and tell people who I was because I wasn't, well, I was on the board of the Chamber of Commerce and I was involved in a women's um, association in, in Columbia, the capital, but I really wasn't as known in that district clearly as the incumbent. And so it had gotten hard. It had gotten um, sexist a bit. It had gotten racist a bit. It had gotten to all the bad places you never want a race to go. And I was just beaten down one day. We were at this Chinese restaurant, and we got our fortune cookie, and I opened it. And it said, winners do what losers don't want to. And from that point on, I taped it to my computer screen, and that really is what gave me the motivation to not just run, but to win. It's what gave me the motivation to go to rooms that were uncomfortable to go to. It gave me the motivation to push harder when it didn't always feel comfortable. And it really was the first time I learned to push through the fear. And you know, I always tell 
young people everywhere when I talk to them that one of the best lessons is to push through the fear because when you do, you find out you're so much stronger on the other side. And if you don't, you never know what could have been. So it was uh, that fortune cookie was a great lesson for me and now it's the motto of my life. So it's... Uh, I really enjoyed that story because I too uh, like to save fortune cookies. Uh, or fortunes from the fortune cookies, only the good ones, of course. So you'll understand when my bag is like overflowing with fortunes <laughs> that my husband thinks it's embarrassing. It all comes from that one fortune. So tell me, um, when you decided to run for governor of South Carolina, you had already achieved so much in the state legislature. Had you not run for governor of South Carolina, what other career paths might you have followed? You know, I think when, when I was younger, I actually wanted to be a delivery room nurse. And then I realized I couldn't stand the sight of blood, so that was out. Um, but I really would have stayed in the corporate world. I, st I really would have continued to be an accountant. I do love that still. I love numbers, I love managing, I love trying to find ways to save and get creative with that. And so it definitely would have been that. Well, it sounds like your race for the state legislature was clearly a massive uphill battle running against an incumbent. And you served um, for, was it 10 years? Six years. Six years. And then the race for governor, of course, being a statewide race, um, has its own challenges. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what the toughest part about running a statewide race was? Well, I think it first comes to why I ran in the first place. Um, I had been in the legislature and in South Carolina when legislation is passed across the desk it was voted by voice vote so all in favor say aye all opposed nay the ayes have it but there was never really a recorded vote and that didn't really come into play until there was a piece of legislation that was crossing the desk that would give legislators pay raises all in favor, say aye. All opposed, silence. The ayes have it. Yet to this day, you can't find one legislator that says they voted themselves a pay raise. <laughs> and I got very upset, and I went to the Speaker of the House, who was Republican, and I said, this is why people don't trust us. And the next day, I filed a piece of legislation that said anything important enough to be debated on the floor of the House or the Senate is important enough for each legislator's vote to be on the record. And the speaker pulled me aside and said, put the bill away. We don't need to have it. We will decide what the public needs to see and what they don't. And I remember going home to my husband that night and I said, if I can't even get legislative votes on the record, why am I doing this? And he said, then fight. So I went across the state of South Carolina and I told everyone, I said, did you know of all the bills passed in the House, only 8% were on the record? And did you know of all the bills passed in the Senate, only 1% was on the record? So if you didn't know how your House member voted 92% of the time, if you didn't know how your Senator voted 99% of the time, how did you know who to vote for when you went to the polls? And the people of South Carolina were shocked. Now to put this into perspective, my first year in office I was chairman of the freshman class, my second year I was majority whip, my third year I was put on a powerful business committee, and my fourth year I was subcommittee chair of banking. The year I wouldn't put the bill away, the year that I wouldn't stop the fight, they stripped me of everything. I could take the well and no one would hear me speak. I could put legislation down and no one would co-sponsor. So I ran for governor. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm proud to say that one of the first bills I signed into law is now in South Carolina. Anything debated on the floor of the House or the Senate has to have a vote on the record, but we took it a step for forward just for fun. Every section of the budget has to have a vote on the record as well. That must have been very, very satisfying. Well, and you know, you talk about how hard it was, but the truth was, one, it was tough being blackballed, right? Because I, I completely was blackballed, but then here was a little house member 
who was running against a lieutenant governor, an attorney general, a congressman, and a state senator. And so I truly was Nikki Who. No one knew who I was. And by chance, we had a governor who had a 70% plus approval rating that after this happened, he said, what are you gonna do? And I said, I don't know, I've gotta figure it out. And he said, well, I think you should run for treasurer. He said, because you've got accounting experience. And I said, but it's the policy I love. You know, and so he continued to talk to me and then there was, he went and he said, look, if you run, I will endorse you. And I remember thinking, I had never had anything in my life that was that easy. I had always had to not just work, but suffer through everything. That governor was Mark Sanford. <laughs> and if you've forgotten who Mark Sanford was, um, once I announced I was running, a month to the day when I announced it, he had a friend in Argentina <laughs> and apparently didn't go on the Appalachian Trail and forgot to tell me that he had a friend in Argentina. So it went from the whispers of him endorsing me and me raising money to literally in one press conference second, no one returning my phone calls. And I even had my consultant say, look, you're young, you could run and continue to have name ID. But, you know, and there's something to be said for the fact that you run and you put your name out there. And I said, look, I'm not gonna do anything and not win. It's just not what I do. And I'm not gonna waste my time to get name ID. And I said, if I was good enough to run when I was getting the endorsement, then I should still be good enough to run without an endorsement. And it was, I was always number five when it came to money. I didn't raise near as much money, but we had passion and we had heart and we went out and we communicated to everybody in South Carolina. We went to the places that were uncomfortable to go. We talked to everyone. And at the end of the day, the people of South Carolina said, let's give her a shot. Smart people. <laughs> Now, I'd, I'd like to turn to some of the, the uh, more trying events that, that really uh, were part of the t challenges that you faced in your, in your tenure, beginning um, with the murders at the Mother Emanuel Church. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you had a friend there as well as being your constituents. How did you have the strength to comfort those families who lost people, to be strong for the constituents of your state, uh, and to basically continue to do your job and take care of your family with, with all of this tragedy? You know, when you lead, your job is to take care of everyone, and your job is to protect everyone. And so when this happened, it was the first time we had had a shooting in a church, in a place of worship. And so we, everyone was shell-shocked by this. Um, I always, and if you've heard the story, I apologize, but I have to do this, one, to honor the victims, but two, to give you a feel for what that time and that situation was like. Here you had 12 people who did what so many people in South Carolina do on a Wednesday night. They went to Bible study. But on that night, someone else showed up. He didn't look like them. He didn't act like them. He didn't sound like them. They didn't call the cops. They didn't throw him out. Instead, they pulled up a chair and they prayed with him for an hour. And when they bowed their heads in that last prayer, he began to shoot. These were people like Ethel Lance, who had lost her daughter two years prior to breast cancer, and she had a broken heart. But she would go around Mother Emanuel Church, cleaning the church, singing, one day at a time, sweet Jesus, that's all I ask of you. Give me the strength to do every day what I have to do. Our youngest victim, Tywanza Sanders, had just finished college and had the world in front of him. 
And on that night, he stood in front of his 87-year-old great aunt Susie and looked at the killer and said, you don't have to do this. We mean no harm to you. Or it was people like Cynthia Hurd, whose life motto was simply to be kinder than necessary. That's who these people were. They weren't famous. They weren't well known. But they loved their family. They loved their church. And they loved their community. And when this happened, South Carolina fell to her knees. And my job was to wrap my arms around the state and keep them from falling apart further. And the national media came in. They quickly wanted to define the event. Um, they wanted to talk about the death penalty. They wanted to talk about gun rights. They wanted to talk about racism in South Carolina. They, I mean, they literally wanted to define it. And I remember strong arming them back saying, there will be a time and place where we can have all of those discussions, but right now we need to have respect for the families and, do the, and go to the funerals. And I went to every single funeral. And And then we had to have a very honest conversation with the people of South Carolina and let them know that um, the flag never should have been up there in the first place. And a flag is a living, breathing symbol that represents people. And no one needed to drive by that state house and feel pain. And that it was time for the flag to be moved to a museum. And I will forever give credit to the people of South Carolina because they stepped up in a time of great debate, and they helped make the right decision, and the flag came down. So this was clearly the right thing to do at the right time, and there were many people who were motivated to support you, but there were a lot of others who felt very strongly the, the, other, the other way. Um, you know, and still do to this day to the point when you went out for the press conference, you weren't sure whether anyone would stand next to you. So I had decided, my husband is in the military, and he had been on military training, and I remember texting him saying, I need to talk to you, because it was in my head, but I needed to bounce this off of him to make sure I was thinking right. I hadn't gotten any sleep in two days, and so when he came back, I said, look, I don't, I don't see in any way that that flag can continue to fly. And I said, and if anything, I don't know how I would look at the kids and tell them why the flag was still flying after this. It had been controversial for years. Um, it used to fly above the state house, um, which was put up actually by a Democrat governor. Um, then they had a compromise in 2000. It was put on the grounds in front of the state house, but it was almost more present then. And so I decided that I wanted to call for the flag to come down. And I called a few of my staff members in, said, this is what we're going to do. I want to have meetings on Monday. And do not tell them what the meeting is about, because I knew that a lot of people wouldn't show up. So I had a meeting with Republicans. I had a meeting with Democrats. I had a meeting with congressional members. And I had a meeting with community leaders. And in every one of those meetings, I said, at 4 o'clock, I'm going to have a press conference today asking for the flag to come down. And if you stand with me, I will forever be grateful. And if you don't, I will never let anyone know that you were in this room. And literally, I had my husband there because I thought he was going to be the only one standing with me at 4 o'clock. Um, but it was really amazing. We had... Many people come stand there. One was Strom Thurmond's son, who was a state senator at the time. Um, there was another one that was a Senate leader who had tons of Confederate memorabilia all over his office. And he said, I don't want you standing here by yourself. And then we had members from both sides that stepped up. Now, that didn't mean that it was done. It was The hurdle was it would take a two-thirds vote in both the House and the Senate. And so we went through... Um, a brutal battle and a brutal debate. And, you know, it's funny, recently, you may have seen in the news, there was some comments that they said that I had walked back um, how I felt about the Confederate flag. And it, it goes to question that 
what I said a few weeks ago on the news was that part of the people in South Carolina saw the flag and thought of heritage and service. And another group of people in South Carolina saw the flag and felt pain. My job as governor was never to judge either side. My job as governor was to pull them together in a way that was respectful that allowed them to move forward. And I said that on a, on a radio show recently, and tons of people got upset and said, oh, she's changed, she's walked back. Those were literally the same words I said in 2015. I have said that that flag never should have been there in the first place, but what worries me is the politics are so bad now that I wonder if I would be able to pull that flag down the way life is now. You know, as toxic as, as it is, we have to be willing to listen to each other. We have to be willing to understand, even if there's differences, you can't move people by judging them and condemning them. You have to move people by trying to understand them. It must be so maddening to, to be, be watching The View and to see your words twisted and taken out of context. I, I was at a hotel having breakfast and I, I saw this segment and I was reading your book at the time and I'm thinking, well, that's not what she said. But, or, or, or rather, you know, she, she hasn't said anything different now, but the vast majority of people don't, don't really understand that. You know, and on everything else, I can tune out the media. I can tune out what they say and, and see it as talking heads. On that one, that's painful for me. I mean, it's really hard just because that was such a painful time for me personally. It was a painful time for the state. But I know that I'm right because there's not a person in South Carolina that would tell you that what I said then or what I've said now is exactly what it was back then. Now, your husband, Michael, uh, has been a, a really big source of strength to you. And I always like, hear how he, like to hear how people met, and I'm sure there's a great story here. Can you tell us how you met? I was 17. It was my first weekend at Clemson. Um, and we met then, and we dated for seven years and have been married for 23. He was my first boyfriend. <laughs> So we literally say that we have grown up together, but he is my best friend. He's the one, God bless him, who has to, you know, had to hear it at the end of the night when I was governor, hear it at the end of the night as ambassador. Um, but he's, he's that sounding board. He's the one that keeps me humble enough to not get crazy. He's the one that pushes me to fight when I need to and pulls me back when I'm, when I'm thinking too much. Now, was the first first gentleman, the first gentleman was also the first gentleman to serve in the military while his wife was governor. Um, how, how long was he deployed? You know, he was deployed to Afghanistan, which left me as a single mom governor. Um, and if I didn't love him so much, I would have killed him for that. I mean, truly. Um, you know, and a lot of people said, well, why didn't you you were governor, why didn't you keep him from going? And I said, well, he would have divorced me. Like that, you know, when they get the call, they wait for that call. And there's nothing that should stop them or will stop someone when they've got that in their blood. And so he got the call and we did everything we could to prepare the kids who were younger. And I remember the first three months, one of them was crying every night, missing their dad. And you know, you as a military spouse, your job is to support them and let them know not to worry and you've got everything under control. But in the back of your mind, you always wonder if they're gonna come home and how you'll handle that. And so I didn't always have the best moments. I will tell you that when um, there was one night I had had just a really bad day in the governor's office and came home and the entire first floor of the governor's residence has security cameras. And so they stop midway up the stairs and that's always when I would take a breath because you felt like you were off when they would do that. And I remember one day I went to the wine cabinet and I got a bottle of wine and I was going up the stairs and I looked at the camera and I said, don't judge me. <laughs> because I had just had it. Or, you know, there was another time where some of y'all may remember seeing this. I had to get, I always got the kids out the door every morning. And I had to get my little one out, and he had to wear a tie that day. 
and I couldn't get it on him. It, I couldn't get it right, and this is bad. It was a clip on Tide. I still couldn't get it on right. And so I'm getting him out the door, and security was sitting over there, and I said, I called him over, and I said, Sydney, can you come over? I can't get this tie to go on right. And so he helped me. I kissed his cheeks, sent my son on his way, turned around, go to open the door, and it's locked. And I am in my robe in front of the governor's residence with the door locked. And I'm looking up at the security cameras in what felt like a lifetime. And all of a sudden, my daughter swings the door open and says, Mom, what are you doing outside in your robe? And I said, I got locked out. And she said, I'm late. I got her dressed, sent her out the door. I do my own social media. And I went and I said, what not to do getting locked out of the house, getting the kids out the door. Didn't think anything else of it get dressed, come out, different security agent says to me, Governor, I'm sorry you've had a bad morning. And I said, oh, did you read my social media? He said, no, ma'am, it was on the radio. <laughs> and I look at my phone, and my press office is blowing up my phone saying, did you get locked out of the house in your robe? And I said, yes, why? And they said, because the TV stations are calling asking for the footage. And I'm like, no, wait. And but before I knew it, the Today Show and Good Morning America and The View and everybody was talking about me getting locked out of the house. And all I get is an email from my husband that says, really, Nikki? <laughs> so much for holding the home front. Well, as my husband Tom knows, I would have been moving that cabinet up to the top of the stairs. <laughs> So you're obviously a, a very, very close family, and there are a lot of um, tough decisions that you had to make as a family. How, how did you sort of weigh those difficult decisions? Did you have a kind of a method or process that you used? You know, my, my husband and I were, were partners. You know, we both work. We both <laughs> helped parent. We both, you know, bounce things off of each other. But I think at the end of the day, we have... <laughs> learned and the best way I think for everyone is it's always got to be family first it just does and you know as a mom if something wasn't right with Michael or the kids it would sit with me all day and I've always said if I'm a good wife and a good mom I'll be a good governor if I'm a good wife and a good mom I'll be a good ambassador and that has always been true because you know even if i went into the state house and had a handprint on my skirt or a crayon in my bag it was the times when I forgot to send the permission slip or the time where I forgot to send the snack that would just like stay on me. And so when you keep your family as the priority, then everything falls in line. And so as governor, you're pulled on, and ambassador, you're pulled on to do everything. But we always had Friday nights as Haley Family Fun Nights where the kids decided what we did. We always were sitting at home eating dinner five nights a week um, at the dinner table. And when you had that normalcy in your life, it keeps you from letting your job run away with you and you more controlling your job. So I want to move forward now to the, um, the Republican primaries. You had a number of friends who were, who were running for the nomination. There was a lot of talent on that stage. There really was. And I think everyone knows that President Trump was not your first choice. <laughs> so, you know, he. everyone should know that the president and I knew each other before that primary. So he had been a supporter of mine. And after I won the governor's primary the first time, I got this envelope with this great gold trim. And it had a support check in it. And there was a note that said, you're a winner. And so we had been chatting and talking um, you know, throughout the time. So when he decided to run, he just wasn't my choice. And so that was when I endorsed another candidate and he tweeted, Nikki Haley is an embarrassment to South Carolina. <laughs> and I responded in a tweet and said, bless your heart. So it's a... Uh, <laughs> So, you know, there was a respect that we had for each other. I knew that if you hit him, he would holler. He knew that if you pushed me, I would push back. And so, literally, you know, once he won the primary, I was with him and then, you know, supported him in through the general. 
So did you have, did you sit down with him and talk to him after he won the nomination, or did you, did you just support him as the party's nomination? No, I absolutely supported him as the nominee. So when he was elected president, were you surprised? I was ecstatic, actually. Yes. I mean, my husband and I were up till three in the morning looking at the returns, not believing what we were seeing because the media had just made it out like doomsday. And honestly, if you talk to the president, the story is hysterical. He thought he wasn't going to win that day. No one thought he was going to win that day. And so, you know, it was just such an amazing moment to see that we were able to pull that off and to know that we were going to watch the country change. There's actually one man here, uh, Judge Presco's husband, Tom Cavalier, who told us all that, uh, knew, that uh, he was going to win. <laughs> well, and you know, and I will say, and I, I said this to Leonard Leo last week, the work that the Federalist Society has done in this administration with our judges and with our Supreme Court judges will go on for decades on what it means to have. It's a model that we need to copy term after term after term because as a governor, I felt what a liberal judge versus a non-biased conservative judge would do I felt it at the UN, I felt it in, you know, you feel it in, in federal office. Judges can make the biggest difference when it comes to business, when it comes to quality of life, and when it comes to really protecting your freedom. So I thank God for the Federalist Society. I think it was at one of the meetings right before the election that we had a very spirited debate about the election and it was, uh, as you said, we're all thrilled with the result. So I read in the book that you you were surprised um, when you were asked to be to consider uh, serving as UN ambassador. Can you tell us tell us about that day? You know, I was just I just wasn't expecting it. I loved being governor. I loved serving the state that raised me. It was a fantastic job, and so it wasn't anything that I was looking for. Um, my husband and I take care of my parents. They're both in their 80s. My mom has Parkinson's, so they live with us. We had a daughter that had just started college, a son that was 15 at the time. So it just wasn't anything that from our life that we would be looking for. And so I got the call from Ryan's Priebus, and he said, um, Nikki, the president-elect, wants to see you. And I said, OK, well, I could probably get there next week. And he said, no, we need you to come tomorrow morning. And I said, what does he want to talk to me about? And he said, Secretary of State. I said, right, I'm a governor. I can't be Secretary of State. And he said, well, he wants to talk to you. You need to come. So I go and I meet with him. And you know, the first thing he says when I walk in is, well, I guess your guy didn't win. You know. Because <laughs> he just can't let anything go. I gave him his moment, let him like say what he wanted to say, and then we had a big laugh over it, and then we started to chat. And I said, look, I'm just not your person. I said, we've got too much going on in the world. There's a lot we have to do. You don't need someone with a learning curve, but I want to support you. I want to help you. Anything that I can do to be helpful, I will. Go back to South Carolina. Ryan's calls again. He says, don't say anything. Just listen. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. I said, right, I don't even know what the United Nations does. I just know everybody hates it. <laughs> he, said, he said, well, the president's going to call you on Monday. I need you to be ready. So I go home. My husband's like looking at it on the computer going, Nikki, I think you'd be really good at this. You know, it's, so we sit there. The president calls Monday and he says, all right, Nick, are you going to do this? And I said, well, sir, there would have to be some conditions before I could even consider it. And he said, okay, what are they? I said, well, I've been a governor. I don't want to work for anyone else. I would want to work directly with you, so it would have to be a cabinet position. He said, done, what else? I said, well, I'm a policy girl, and so I'd want to be in the room when decisions are made, so I'd need to be on the National Security Council. He said, done, what else? I said, well, I'm not going to be a wallflower or a talking head. I need to be able to say what I think. 
And he said, Nikki, that's exactly why I want you to do this. And he was true to his word from the first day to the last day. Is she a great negotiator or what? <laughs> you know, I think it's really important that whenever you want to push through the fear, you know, even though that was going to be a huge learning curve to know to push through the fear, but you also have to set the standards for success. I knew the things that I would need to have to be successful. And so I think you have to be willing to say that so that you can be the best. I wanted to be the best for him that I could do. And so I knew that I needed those things. What did you think that your biggest challenges uh, would be as ambassador? I mean, obviously the foreign policy curve, right? Because I knew all things domestic policy, and the only part of foreign policy I knew was in my recruiting of companies to South Carolina, which we did have more foreign investment under my term than any other state in the country, which I'm really proud of. Um, <laughs> But it was, it was negotiating on business terms. And so when you get into foreign policy, it's very different. And so clearly, learning it as fast as I could and you know who our friends were, who our foes were, what the history was, where we want to go, that was, that was clearly the biggest challenge. But then you know once we got there, it was just about doing the job. And I knew that when I went in, I purposely didn't study the do's and don'ts of the UN. I wanted to be able to ask for forgiveness as opposed to being told the protocols because I knew what my job was and I just wanted to get there. And I didn't care about people liking us. I wanted people to know what the United States stood for and what we stood against and did not have any gray area. Because what I did know is through the past administration, a lot of countries didn't exactly know where we were. And I wanted to make sure that there was it was all black and white, that there was no gray in the way that we communicated that out. In addition to the preparation that the administration gave you to prepare for your hearings, you also got a big assist from your son, right? So my son, who um, our daughter floats through life, and if you asked her what I did the last couple of years, she'd say, I don't know, she had a job in New York. Um, but if you asked my son, he could literally tell you everything I've ever said. And he would, if I would do interviews on TV, he would say, Mom, you did fine, but you're better than that. You know, like he was really hard on me. And so when he, I almost didn't take the job because he was 15 and I didn't want to move him at the time. And he's the one that said, mom, you have to do this. And so the first, I'm a big whiteboard person. And so the first thing I did was I had three big whiteboards brought into the office at the governor's residence so that I could make notes. And I walked in the first day to start studying and my son had already written on one of the whiteboards, um, countries we like and countries we don't. <laughs> and he listed it all out. <laughs> and he was actually totally accurate. Well, st still impresses me to this day. How did your son like living in New York City? You know, my son just thrived in New York. I was terrified. And the, you know, the first time he went out, I was like, where are you going? Who are you going with? And he's like, I'll be back later. And he was on the subway and on a train and all that. He knows New York better than I do. But I will tell you, he just grew up. But he grew up in such a smart way. And, you know, learning logistics and becoming independent and all that. I will forever be grateful to New York for raising him because they really did a good job. They really did. Oh, so, so much of your interaction at the UN was uh, on the Security Council uh, or with other delegates. Uh, did you have an opportunity to interact much with the Secretary General? I did. I actually would meet with him quite often, um, would talk to him quite often, and look, it was my job to talk with the Secretary General because we were paying, you know, 23 percent of that budget, and I wanted to make sure he knew exactly that I was focused on how it was being spent, what we were doing, and to make sure that any anti-American sentiment or anti-Israeli sentiment wasn't happening through his office. So you, you had some preconceptions of the UN. A lot of it was that you know people don't like it. What was the most surprising thing that you learned about the UN after uh, your, your time there? You know, the UN is not a place for 
the soft hearted. You know, every, I, I say that it really felt like every day um, you put on body armor because you knew that there was going to be a fight that day. You just didn't know which country you were going to be fighting. Um, but what surprised me so much or what I look back on is many countries resented us and many countries would speak against us, but they all wanted to be us. And they would all, when they would pull me aside or when we would talk, they loved the fact at how open we were and our freedom of speech and our freedom of worship and our freedom to, to congregate and do what we wanted to do. They loved the idea that we could think freely for ourselves and do those things. And so even though they would resent us, they always wanted us to lead because they thought we were the moral authority. And they would much rather lead, the United States lead, than China or Russia. And so it's really important that the United States always have an opinion and always use the power of our voice because there's a lot of countries depending on knowing what that is and wanting to follow even if they don't say it in words. Now you, you knew that there were a, going to be a lot of struggles uh, you know, with certain countries the, on the Security Council. And you, ex you expected that, and you knew it was going to be a tough battle at times. Did you expect that you were going to have some of the power struggles uh, within the cabinet? I mean, that's just politics, right? I mean, I think that I I'm sure every administration has their drama and has their issues. I was there to do a job. And I am one of those that, you know, when we had National Security Council meetings once a week or once every other week, I would go to DC, I would do my meetings, and I would leave just as quick as I got there. I didn't want to be a part of the drama. I didn't want to be a part of you know, the gossip and stuff that was going on. I didn't have time for that or the patience for that. So when you have things come up, the thought is not to be a part of the drama, but just to cut through a lot of the nonsense to get the job done. And that is, I had a very close relationship with the president. There was not a time where I called that he didn't call me right back. Um, he would often call and ask what I thought on certain issues. And, you know, many people want to know how I got out of the administration without a tweet. <laughs> and I was very honest with the president. When he would do something good, I would rally, I would support, I would do everything I could to help him. And if he did something that I thought was going in the wrong direction, I would immediately meet or call him and say, I think this is not the best. Instead, I would consider doing X. And he would always say, well, how do you see that playing out? And he would hear me out on that. That doesn't mean I won all the time. But there was always constant dialogue. So I always felt heard. And as long as you feel heard and you feel like, you know, I wanted him to know everything. And I put that in front of him. At the end of the day, he was the president. And whatever decision he chose, I would support as long as I knew that he had all of the facts in front of him. Now, there were a couple of references in the book to some uh, exchanges with Rex Tillerson. Do you think that he had a, was it a, personality conflict with you, or is he the kind of person that just wants to be supreme over everyone, including the president? <laughs> you know, I was really excited when Rex was named Secretary of State because I love to see business people get into government positions. I love to see people from the outside come in and put common sense to work. And you know, I just, I think that he had a different style than I did. Um, you know, I'm more vocal and he was more quiet. I, I wanted us to be a team and be able to both, you know, work together and he wanted to do things in a silo. And so it was just a different style of doing things. And, you know, I've often, I respect Rex um, as a patriot, as I respect anybody else that serves in the administration, because it's a huge um, sacrifice and it's not easy. But I do strongly believe that there is only one president. 
And when he makes a decision, you have a duty and an honor to either support it or to leave. And And what I talk about the book is that there were a couple of officials that literally would stall what he wanted done, just not do it, tell him they would do it and it not happen. So we all saw this. This wasn't just me. We all saw as the national security team this happening. And, you know, I just, I think they should have had the nerve to go there and tell the president. But I think at the end of the day, it is your duty to the American people to follow through on what the leadership says they want to do. And I think there were some struggles with that. Yeah, there, there were some pretty tense moments when, when you were arguing for uh, reducing the funding for UNRWA and for supporting the president's view to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel. And <laughs> Rex Tillerson and, and John Kelly had other ideas. Well, you know, I don't want to get into what their ideas were, but I strongly believed that we did need to get out of the Paris Climate Agreement. I did think that we needed to get out of the Iran deal. I did think we needed to move the embassy to Jerusalem. And these were the things the president wanted done. And we all had our chance to give our peace to the president and tell him exactly what we thought. He listened to all of us, but when he walked out of that room, the decision was made. And, and I think some people struggled with that. And I think, you know, Rex struggled and, and John Kelly struggled with that. But again, I strongly believe, even with 16 people on that stage, and I said a lot of talent on that stage, I don't know any one of them that would have had the courage to do the things that this president has done when it comes to foreign policy. When he held the red line on Syria after they did the chemical weapons strike, to see that, to see the fact that you know, we were able to move the embassy to pull out of the Iran deal, but then do the maximum pressure. And I have to tell you, when it comes to Soleimani, you can go to my speeches two years ago, and I talked about how dangerous Soleimani was. The president was showing... The president... This wasn't a knee-jerk decision. The president had shown so much resistance over this time on not doing something that I think his timing was right, I think his thought was right, and I think the way he handled that, the world is a better place because of it. And so... Uh, you know, this is probably an unfair question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. You had so many successes um, in what you did at the UN and, and events that you helped shape uh, that the, the, the president decisions that the president made that you supported. Um, between the imposition of sanctions um, on North Korea, rescinding the uh, Iran nuclear deal, uh, withdrawing from the Paris uh, Climate Accord, getting out of the UN Human Rights Commission, moving the embassy, is there any one that really you could single out and say, like, this was the biggest achievement? I mean, I loved them all, right? Because they were, I, I think anytime you, um, you know, shed, you know, anytime you just really go into a challenge and you're able to push it further, it's a good feeling. And I think that the two that probably come to mind the most, because I, I worked so hard on them, was getting all of the members of the Security Council to agree on those three sanctions packages against North Korea was a game changer. And that was so hugely important at stopping Kim from producing more. And then getting out of the Iran deal, you know, there were very few people that the president, that were with the president on that. And that was one of the issues where when he wasn't getting some of the members of his team to go in that direction, I said, let me go to the IAEA in Vienna and question them on how their 
um, managing Iran and how they're reporting and let me dig into this and if you want to get out let me sell it to the American people and so being able to go over there and come back and telling the truth and then giving speeches on why the president would be validated in getting out of the Iran deal and seeing him follow through with that that was huge and then the move of the embassy to Jerusalem defining a truth was huge all three of those were actually fantastic I mean Now, I think that you had some, some warning of this uh, before going into the UN, but you saw some horrific atrocities with dictators, you know, starving their people, using chemical weapons against them, allowing rape to be used as a weapon uh, against women and children. How, how, do, how did you process all of that, and, and what tools did, did you sort of develop to kind of help you to disengage uh, or to step away from that stress? I have an inability to step away from that. I mean, if when you see people suffering, not only can you not disengage from it, you can't unsee it. You can't unfeel it. You can't stop thinking about it. It's one of those things that you go into. And, you know, I, I always tell people, and I think it's so important to know that just through my eyes, we were, you know, in... South Sudan where they use rape as a weapon of war. Or we went to the Congo and met with women and heard the story of a woman whose baby was taken from her arms and thrown into a fire. And she was later forced to eat his flesh. When you go on the Simon Bolivar Bridge from Venezuela to Colombia and you see thousands of people holding their babies in the hot sun to get the one meal they might get that day, the average Venezuelan adult has lost 24 pounds. When you see pictures of dead children from chemical weapons from Assad, you can't forget those things. But the one thing I want all of us to remember is after seeing all of that, remembering that on our worst day, we are blessed to live in America. Now, I know I'm, I'm running out of time. I have like one minute. But um, as a woman who is not afraid of the word ambition, what is next for Nikki Haley? <laughs> well, I have always been blessed with the fact that I never said, I want to do this in 10 years or this in 20 years. That was my sister. I was never like that. Um, so life has always surprised me. I have always believed that if... You put yourself and give everything you've got to your job or to anything you do in life. Um, doors open. And so, you know, my mom would always say, whatever you do, be great at it and make sure people remember you for it. And every time I did that, doors would open. And so the reason why I left the UN was not because I didn't love the job or I didn't love what it was. It was the fact that um, our son was a senior, going to be a senior in high school, and I wanted to do the college visits with him, and I wanted to be there as he was selecting where his second home was going to be. I wanted to be there for my parents um, as they're aging and getting older. And so leaving the job was hard, but putting family first was more important. And I think now it's about taking it a year at a time. So this next year, we started a policy group last year, which is doing fantastic. It's called Stand for America. And we're really engaging college students and young professionals and people around the country on capitalism versus socialism and why there's an anti-Israel. <laughs> why there is an anti-Israel bias and, and what we're seeing with anti-Semitism, what they need to be doing in terms of college campuses and getting their voices out and having their backs. And, you know, talking about what the Green New Deal and, and Medicaid for All and what these things really mean. And so we are pushing great policy issues out. If you want to join, go standforamerica.com. Um, and then, you know, I wanted to write the book so that people would actually know what it was like in the UN to better understand our foreign policy and what the president was doing. And this is going to be the year of a lot of campaigning for a lot of good people that need to be reelected or put into office. And so you'll see me campaigning for the president. I've already started to do that. I am campaigning for a lot of senators who are in very vulnerable seats. Um, 
House members as well as governors. And so I'm going to continue to do my part. I have said I know I'm too young to stop fighting. So you will see me always fighting for something. And I'll take it a year at a time to see what that's going to be. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. I feel like um, I've asked you so much about the book, but is there a special nugget that I haven't asked you about that you want to tell us? No, I think that for the ladies in the room, reading the chapter on leadership and women in leadership and the story behind With All Due Respect um, is a lesson for all of us, men and women. But I, I think that certainly um, talking about being a woman leader and what that means um, and how strong girls lead to strong women and strong women can literally change the world. I think that's an important chapter. Thank you.